president announced his pick to fill the vacancy on the Supreme Court, what might we expect from Catholic jurist Brett Kavanaugh? Chief counsel for the Judicial Crisis Network, Kerry Severino, joins us with analysis. And President Trump is on the road this week meeting with NATO leaders, the UK's Theresa May, and later Vladimir Putin. Foreign policy expert at the Cato Institute, John Glazer, weighs in on the president's global tour. And finally, mother of poet and peace advocate Maddie Stepanek, Dr. Jenny Stepanek, joins us to talk about the National Day of Peace campaign. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Carrie Severino, John Glasser, and Jenny Stepanek are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout. And now some news from the world over. President Donald Trump picked Judge Brett Kavanaugh to be the next justice of the U.S. Supreme Court this week. And as expected, Democratic leaders and liberal interest groups have come out against the nomination. A ferocious confirmation battle is underway. The 53-year-old D.C. Circuit judge comes with a prolific record of judicial restraint. His confirmation could reset the trajectory of American jurisprudence for decades to come, away from the activist Supreme Court that created constitutional rights to abortion and same-sex marriage to something more restrained. Judge Kavanaugh has spent the days since Monday's nomination working the halls of the Senate and meeting with key lawmakers. He's also continued his charity work. On Wednesday, Kavanaugh was spotted serving meals to the homeless outside Catholic charities in downtown Washington. Before we go to our first guest, here's Brett Kavanaugh accepting his nomination earlier this week. If confirmed by the Senate, I will keep an open mind in every case, and I will always strive to preserve the Constitution of the United States and the American rule of law. Joining me now with her analysis of the Kavanaugh nomination, I'm joined by Chief Counsel for the Judicial Crisis Network, Carrie Severino. Carrie, thanks for being here. Great to be Pleasure here. Pleasure to see you again. Uh, I want to start with the LA Times. It published a story just this week, Kavanaugh praises Rehnquist, uh, that the, what he called a separation of church and state that is fraudulent. And then they went on to quote Kavanaugh saying, Roe v. Wade is part of the judicial creation of unenumerated rights. Your thought on how important this might be, this old speech, and what does it tell us about Kavanaugh and his perspective on Roe? Yeah, I think, I think what we're seeing here is almost anyone the president picked, this, the line we were hearing even before the nominee was announced is, this is the vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. They're trying to peel off some uh, pro-choice Republican mm -hmm. uh, votes here. Mm -hmm. I think the, the big problem with that argument is, Really, the swing vote at this point is Chief Justice Roberts. And I don't think anyone knows for sure what he would do. He likes to move in incremental fashions. I think they're also overreading what it was really in his speech a commentary on Chief Justice Rehnquist's mm -hmm. own um, jurisprudence and, and his approach to the law. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that we've seen other places where they're trying to put words in his mouth because they're hoping this will be the hot button yeah. uh, issue. But really, we've got this is someone who has a dozen years in the bench, 300 cases, and so why we're digging up, you know, cases or speeches he's talking about another judge, it, it shows that they really have, they can't poke any holes in yeah. the things he's actually written as a judge, which actually are widely respected across the, the political spectrum. Give, give me a sense of why Kavanaugh, why now, given the other three nominees that were supposedly in the running in the final four that, uh, that uh, President mm -hmm. Trump had delineated, why do you think he chose Kavanaugh, who does have such a deep record, like Hardiman? I mean, there are a lot of rulings you can dig through, 300. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the question is, is that a feature or a bug? I think some people go, oh, no, now right. he's on the record and things. But actually, one of the things this president has said is he wants someone who is, isn't just able to talk the talk, but they have illustrated they can walk the walk. Mm -hmm. And so he's someone who, it's not just talking about, well, I know the president wants to hear as someone who is interested in originalism or interested in textualism, and so I know what to say in an interview, for example. He's got 300. 
100 opinions showing that he can put it into practice on a whole variety of issues, a whole variety of type of statutes or pro constitutional provisions he's looking at. And so you can see that he can do it in practice and that he's got had the courage on so many different occasions to stand up with a, a decision he knows is legally right, but he knows he's going to get pushback for. His Catholicism, Brett Kavanaugh's yeah. Catholicism has taken center stage. I want to play this for you. Uh, this from the announcement of his nomination. Watch. The motto of my Jesuit high school was men for others. I've tried to live that creed. I am part of the vibrant Catholic community in the D.C. area. The members of that community disagree about many things, but we are united by a commitment to serve. So that's what the judge might say. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post, they, they published a piece the other day. A Catholic faces a historical struggle between canon and constitutional law. The Daily Beast, the president is carrying out the agenda of a small, secretive network of extremely conservative Catholic activists in making this appointment. Are you concerned about the way that this is being painted, the faith of this jurist being uh, used against him in this process? Well, it's it's discouraging because, of course, we all saw Judge Barrett's confirmation mm -hmm. hearings last fall and the shameful anti-Catholic attacks that were launched there. I was hoping the left had learned from that because there was a lot of pushback even from the left mm -hmm. saying, we don't go there as a country. It's unconstitutional to have a religious test for office. But it sounds like people are, are, are maybe going back to that same rotten well, which is unfortunate. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's something the American people wants to have as part of the discussion. Judge Kavanaugh's proud of his faith. He's been active in his parish. He's active in coaching the CYO basketball okay. team and volunteering. That's something we should celebrate. It's not something we should uh, be attacking him for. Well, uh, even the religious news service, I saw a piece the other day, and, and the piece was... Uh, Catholic heavy Supreme Court moves right while church moves left. Almost as if we've reached the limit of Catholics on the court. But Justice Kennedy is a Catholic. <laughs> I mean, he's replacing a Catholic. Exactly. The, the balance of Catholic power on the yeah. court, whatever that's supposed to mean, that is not changing. And, and you know, this, isn't, this shouldn't be about a, a politics one way or the other. I think, it, if anything, you should celebrate that there are Catholics on, on all sorts of, as he said, there's, there's lots of different opinions mm -hmm. politically within the Catholic Church. Do you think we're going to hear so. Barrett-like questioning from Dianne Feinstein and others in this nominating you, you may well hear them go back again to those, those same uh, tired talking points I, again, I hope not, but I think it's unfortunately part of this landscape where now character assassination, distortions of the record, even outright mm -hmm. lies and deception are often being launched at these candidates and uh, or these nominees um, for the Supreme Court on down. I want to play you something. This is uh, Senator Chuck Schumer reacting to this nomination. And part of this, to put it in context, people should know. Brett Kavanaugh worked for the Bush administration. He, was, he worked under uh, Alberto Gonzalez. Uh, he was also the man who wrote, worked in the Ken Starr investigation, the Whitewater investigation, and wrote the Starr report. Watch this. Judge Kavanaugh's long track record of partisan politics comes with a long paper trail. The pro-hard right business heritage foundation wants only nominees who will side with the big boys against the average person. And in Judge Kavanaugh, they've gotten someone who would do just that. We cannot let it happen. Your thoughts? Well, a lot of times you see these scare tactics where they'll go and say, oh, this is the kind of person who votes, you know, fill in the blank, against unions or for corporations mm -hmm. or against, against the little guy, against, against women's reproductive rights. If you look at the actual cases, that, that is the question. You'll see he has a long list of ruling in favor of, of people on both sides of the aisle. I mean, whether it's in favor of the prosecution, sometimes the defendants, it's not because he's looking to try to tally up, okay, I need to balance it out. I've had too many pro-defendant rulings. Now I'm gonna... No, it's about looking in each case on the facts and the law before him. And sometimes the laws are going to rule one side and sometimes another. One that I, I like to cite is in a, it was a campaign finance case. And a lot of times the left is the one, are the ones screaming about those saying, well, this is just something trying to make the way for, pave the way for conservative organizations. He found independent expenditures uh, limitations to violate the First Amendment in the context of Emily's List, a pro-abortion mm -hmm. uh, group that was seeing it, it. For him, it's not about politics. It's about the principle. And that's that's what we should have in our in our system of justice across the board. So it's, it is equal protection under the law 
for all parties. What do you make of the charge that uh, all of this baggage, he's got so much political baggage and a track record there, that by guilt by association and dredging up the sins of Ken Starr or the Bush administration will be used against Brett Kavanaugh. And was that the smartest political calculation on the part of the administration, knowing all of that, despite the great jurisprudence and, and the record of the rulings themselves by Brett Kavanaugh? Well, I think they, they knew that going in, and they judged that, you know, here's someone who is so stellar, so so smart, an articulate writer, mm -hmm. a persuasive jurist, that no, even knowing they would go, that the left would go low on, on some of these things, that it was worth doing it. In some ways, I think those attacks illustrate what a strong candidate Kavanaugh is for this position, mm -hmm. because they don't really have anything, even in 300 opinions, 12 years in the bench, that they can point to and say, see, look, he, he yeah. had this horrible ruling here, this clearly didn't follow the law. They're going to guilt by association. It's either guilt by association with Ken Starr or with George Bush or with Donald Trump. They're trying to get him from that angle because on, on the merits, he's outstanding. He wrote the um, suggestions, because there were suggestions to the Congress to impeach Bill Clinton back in the 90s, 19, what was it, 98, um, in, the, in the Starr report. Among those, he says the Congress should move to impeach Clinton because of his inability to submit to questioning in a quick fashion with the independent counsel. You know that's going to be thrown at him now, vis-a-vis -vis President Trump and the ongoing Mueller probe. Uh, now, I know Brett Kavanaugh has since moderated and, and in 2009 said no president should be investigated while he sits in office. Do you think that will be a, a focus of the scrutiny in these confirmation hearings? I'm sure they're, they're going to talk about it. They already have. And I think it's interesting to note that the 2009, this is a law review article he mm -hmm. wrote, but it's significant. First of all, that he wrote it when Obama was president, right? Mm -hmm. So this isn't something where he's saying, oh, good, now we've got a Republican in office. Right. Let's not do these anymore. No, he wrote it while there was a Democrat in office. So it would have, if his recommendations would have applied to the Democrat. But it's also important to note that he isn't saying, I think judges should refuse to do this. He's saying, here's what I think Congress should do. Here's the problems I think with the current system. But it's never, and then courts should be the ones to do it. It's Congress has that role. That, I think, is a, is a great uh, indicator that he, he's a, he is not someone who's going to put his own policy preferences. So if, if he's mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court, he's not going to make that law review article yeah. law. He's going to say, maybe Congress should do that. And if they do it, he'll enforce it. Are you surprised to read the report in the Washington Post this week that Kavanaugh ran up his credit cards and incurred credit card debt to buy Nats baseball tickets. They, wh wh first of all, yeah. why is this a big deal? I mean, it's like asking a Saints fan in New Orleans, did you charge your Saints tickets? It's like a, a matter of civic right. duty. Why is that a problem? I, you know, I think they're just grasping at straws again. Mm -hmm. And there's even been a whole Twitter hashtag now created, Brett Kavanaugh scandal, because it's they, they have all these things like Brett Kavanaugh once cut the label off of his mattress. Oh. Or, you know, Brett Kavanaugh once signed the terms and conditions without actually reading them. Wow. It's that kind of level of we're trying to find something. And if, if all you've got is this guy loves a baseball team that just can't seem to win, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. You'll defend him. Yeah. You'll defend him. Uh, finally, before I let you go, uh, Judge Napolitano, Andy Napolitano, uh, this week just wrote a piece that, uh, frankly, was surprising in that he's disappointed with the Kavanaugh pick. And he says this is the establishment, the swamp in D.C., winning out over Donald Trump. And he's arguing this on civil libertarian grounds. He says that Kavanaugh has no problem with allowing the government to probe into all parts of our lives and deny us our privacy. So your reaction? I, what he's referring to, I, I believe, is a case that Judge Kavanaugh sat on that had to do with some of those, the investigations, uh, you know, the NSA investigations. He says very clearly in that case, he is bound by Supreme Court precedent. And I thought it was notable that he even said that explicitly. As much as people might disagree with this law, I'm bound by the precedent. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows whether he really agrees with it. The good news is that precedent isn't even really law anymore. The Supreme Court just this term had the Carpenter case, which said mm -hmm. that the government can't access, uh, for example, you know, your cell phone records from mm -hmm. the cell phone towers. So you know, as a lower court judge, he did the right thing there. Well, I don't know whether he agrees with that underlying precedent, but that's not even the precedent anymore right. when he's in the Supreme Court. Now, I read somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, that your organization, uh, Judicial Crisis Network spent something like $10 million on the Gorsuch nomination, mm -hmm. placing ads, making sure the public was aware of his record. Uh, there, are, there are Democratic groups committing tens of millions of dollars to opposing Brett Kavanaugh. 
Are you concerned that this is how we get a Supreme Court justice to the bench these days, that you have to mount a campaign to support them? It's frustrating that that's, that that's the case. Mm -hmm. When Justice Scalia talked about this, he said, look, this shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that judges have any political valence mm -hmm. because they should just be looking at the law passed by our elected representatives, be they Democrat, Republican, whatever. Right. Unfortunately, we, we live in a world where many judges do just that, and they are substituting their policy goals. And as long as the court is up there substituting its own view of where the American people should be or is policy-wise mm -hmm. for the, the actual text of the law and the Constitution, then we maybe have to look at the details of what their personal views are or it becomes a political thing. Mm -hmm. I think if we could get more judges and justices to step back and, and limit themselves to the text there, we wouldn't have to have this debate. But as long as they're having it, mm. we, we feel like we have to be ready to defend the nominee. We saw what happened with Judge Bork when people were blindsided right. by those attacks. No one was expecting, because that mm. was not a thing before yeah. Bork, to attack judges, especially in, in really a way that I think was very dishonest about his own record. And again, Ted Kennedy dug up all the Nixon Absolutely. years and used it against him. You were the man who got rid of Archibald Cox. And yes. it was like, Ugh. Yeah. you know, and everybody's hair was on fire. And he, he was finished. And Judge Bork, a great legal mind denied denied uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court yeah and that and, and so we want to make sure that doesn't happen again and I think people weren't ready to no one thought that the, that the the hearings were going to go take that turn I mean mm -hmm. Justice Scalia just a few years before had been had worked in the Nixon administration had worked in the Ford administration mm -hmm. and he was confirmed unanimously so mm -hmm. that that I feel, feel like is where we took a real sharp turn I'd love to pull back from that, but as of right now, if they're going to be attacking Kavanaugh, especially with unfair uh, misconstructions of his own record, mm -hmm. someone's got to step up to defend him, and that's my job. Do you think this will be a bloody, ugly battle, confirmation battle? I'm, I'm afraid it will certainly be a bruising one, uh, but I know that uh, Judge Kavanaugh is someone who is so bright, so smart, and really mm -hmm. within the legal academy, within the federal bench, judges on, on both, both sides. Both sides, yeah recognize what, what a stellar jurist is. I've spoken is. to some of his I mean, interns who now work for Elena Kagan and other people who, yeah. you know, he has a great relationship across the aisle and he's loved him. Yeah. By, so by he'll be able to stand his yeah. own in these hearings. I, I, am, I am very confident. And, I, and mm -hmm. I know there's people, you know, Akhil Rita Marr, a famous law professor, Yale law professor, who is defending him and himself gotten a lot of pushback, even though he's that. very liberal. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, look, this is someone who deserves uh, to be looked at more closely. So we'll all have a chance to watch that during the confirmation hearings. And I think we'll get to learn more about Judge Kavanaugh. And he, he is so articulate, he'll be able to very adequately defend himself, even against these unfair attacks. Carrie Severino, thank you, as always, for being here. Thanks. You can follow Carrie's work at the Judicial Crisis Network. They are at judicialnetwork.com. John Glasser is up next, but first, more news. There is some disagreement among the bishops over a recent Supreme Court decision. Bishop Thomas Poprocki of Springfield, Illinois, took issue with the U.S. Bishops' Conference rejection of a court decision that ruled that public sector employees cannot be required to pay union dues. The U.S. bishops lamented the decision, citing the long-held view of so many bishops in support of labor unions. The U.S. Bishops' Conference went so far as to submit a friend of the court brief in support of the union that was being sued. But Bishop Poprocki issued a dissent from the conference's opinion in a video statement saying, Unions should not expect the unquestioning support of the church when their objectives are contrary to the person's religious and moral duties. Forcing public employees to subsidize unions that promote such immoral policies and activities is just not right. It is encouraging that the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Janus v. AFSCME upholds the right to be free from coercion in speech. As Pope St. John Paul II said, God's law does not reduce, much less do away with human freedom. The head of Pope Francis' super dicastery for the laity, family, and life is taking a little heat for saying priests are not the best people to prepare couples for marriage. In an interview with an Irish Catholic publication, Cardinal Kevin Farrell, the former Bishop of Dallas, spoke of the need for the church to rely on the laity for pastoral tasks because of the sheer numbers of those needing help, namely marriage counseling and preparation. Fair enough. But from there, he appeared to question the ability of the priests themselves. Farrell said, with regard to marriage, priests, quote, have no credibility, they have never lived the experience, they may know moral theology, dogmatic theology in theory, but to go from there to putting it into practice every day, they don't have the experience. 
Cardinal Farrell made a similar comment last year. Among those who have criticized the Vatican prefect for his point of view was Bishop Thomas Tobin of Providence. He tweeted this week, it seems fair to ask then if a celibate cleric has sufficient credibility to lead a dicastery devoted to laity, family, and life. Meanwhile, the media's sound and fury over President Trump's bluster at the NATO summit has come and gone. When he arrived in Brussels, Trump repeated his call for some member nations to pay their fair share toward the military alliance. He further called out Germany for being a captive to Russia because of a multi-billion dollar gas line deal. Ultimately, NATO resolved to develop new plans for its defense against Russia and terrorism. Now for analysis of the NATO summit and a preview of the president's meeting with Vladimir Putin is Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, John Glasser. John, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Uh, I want to play something for you. This is from the presser today at NATO. The president was asked about Putin, and he put it this way. Well, he's a competitor. He's been very nice to me the times I've met him. I've been nice to him. He's a competitor. You know, somebody was saying, is he an enemy? No, he's not my enemy. Is he a friend? No, I don't know him well enough. But the couple of times that I've gotten to meet him, we got along very well. You saw that. Um, I hope we get along well. I think we get along well. Uh, but ultimately, he's a competitor. He's representing Russia. I'm representing the United States. What do you make of that? Well, it's a lot of uh, words without yeah, much meaning. Right. Um, but I think it does indicate Trump's tendency to view the world in personal relationships as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, competing national strategies. And what do you expect to come from this meeting? I mean, Trump does place a lot of emphasis on that personal yeah. relationship and camaraderie. I mean, gosh, when he and Macron were meeting here in Washington, I thought they were going to get a room. And now you, you see him setting up a similar thing here. What's the end goal for the United States? Well, there's lots of things that we could try to accomplish in a meeting with mm -hmm. Putin. I mean, uh, the New START treaty that was signed under the Obama administration that caps our long-range nuclear uh, uh, forces, are, uh, that's a solid treaty that Russia wants to extend. They've expressed interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. It expires in 2021. We could, we could work on extending that. Uh, there's a lot of things to do with regard to Syria. Uh, Russia's military presence in Syria, unlike ours, is actually legal. They have the permission of the host government there. They can help on counterterrorism. Uh, they, can, they can help stabilize the Assad regime. They can help rebuild some of the destruction now that things are dying down. Um, on North Korea, if Trump wants to continue to have some kind of maximum pressure policy and keep up sanctions before he sees some kind of movement on denuclearization from Pyongyang, he's going to need Russia's cooperation on that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of substance to talk about. Yeah. Whether or not they'll get to any of that, yeah, I'm not quite the sure. The president says is, there's not a big agenda here. Yeah. There's not a big agenda. It seems there's a huge agenda. I mean, uh, so I, I wonder why this, uh, the downplaying, is that to downplay expectations of what might come of this? It might be to downplay expectations, but it's also to try to counter the extremely high temperature that U.S.-Russia mm -hmm. relations are in right now, mm -hmm. uh, domestically in the United States at least. Right. So, for example, there's a lot of questions about whether or not Trump is going to, quote-unquote, recognize uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea or try mm -hmm. to lift sanctions that are associated with that move. Um, I don't I doubt that'll happen, it, but, you know, yeah. Trump, who, who well, knows? Putin, Putin has taken Crimea off the table, right? That's yeah. not part of the discussions. There is no possible way that Putin is going to walk back what happened in Crimea any more that Israel is going to start to give back the Golan Heights or anything like this. That territory is now Russia's, and no amount of sanctions or browbeating from the United States is going to reverse it. The other point of controversy here, of course, is Russian meddling in the 2016 election, mm -hmm. which Trump has been reluctant. Uh, well, he said he'd bring it up. He said he'd bring it up, but he's been reluctant to believe the assessment of the U.S. intelligence community, mm -hmm. much to the chagrin of many in his cabinet and on Capitol Hill. Um, but, you know, again, bringing it up there is probably not going to add very much. Uh, cyber offensive cyber operations and retaliations are probably just going to mm -hmm. escalate things unnecessarily. Yeah. And so you're right that uh, not much might be able to be accomplished at this meeting. Hmm. Uh, the thing that I find curious is, though the president is not going to be discussing Crimea at all, the fact is NATO continues to defend the Ukrainian forces there that are pushing back against uh, Putin. Uh, we have heavy sanctions that continue to be 
uh, placed upon Russia for this action. That's not that hasn't been moved in the least under Trump. He's in fact he's pushed forward and continued those sanctions. No, you're right, and, it, and it's it's a good point to make because there's a lot of uh, consternation in the establishment in Washington mm -hmm. about Trump's kind of uh, coddling Russia. We heard it today from Nancy Pelosi that uh, he's cozying up to to Putin to the detriment of NATO. Right. Not Do you only, see it that way? Well, no. I mean, not only yeah, the criticism is that he's cozying up to mm -hmm. to Russia, but also berating NATO allies, but mm -hmm. policy hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. We, in last April, we invited uh, the 29th member of, of NATO, Montenegro. Mm. Uh, we might be doing the same thing with Macedonia now. Mm. So NATO is continuing to expand, which is exactly the opposite of Trump's kind of NATO is obsolete right. rhetoric. And it's exactly what Trump, what Putin does not want. We're uh, doubling down on uh, delivery of lethal weapons to Ukraine to fight Russian separatist groups mm -hmm. uh, in, in the east. Um, we're doing uh, military exercises in the Baltics. I mean, policy-wise, we're just as hard on Russia as we always have been, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. well, Putin wants those, those military exercises in the Baltics to stop. Do you Definitely. see that happening? Or Trump caving on that? Uh, well, he's going to face a lot of internal resistance to a move like that. Not only is Secretary Mattis kind of reaffirming the importance of NATO and these kinds of military exercises, but... Um, you know, the, the, the rest of the allies definitely support them. So it'd be very, it's be, be an uphill battle for Trump to promise something like that. So what do you think he is looking for from Vladimir Putin in this meeting? What do you think is the agenda here for the United States or the must-do agenda items? Well, the problem is that I don't think there is much of an mm -hmm. agenda. So, for example, uh, the same with the Kim summit, the, mm -hmm. the summit mm -hmm. with North Korea. Trump is a lot about stagecraft and not that much about statecraft. Uh, he doesn't dig down into the issues. He doesn't have a granular understanding or knowledge of the specific policy or strategic issues at play. Mm -hmm. He loves the pageantry of diplomacy. He loves meeting with uh, big players in the international community. And he loves kind of sticking it in the craw of uh, the rest of establishment Washington. And mm -hmm. that was the case with the meeting with Kim Jong-un, and it's going to be the case with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, but different from, the, just to take a little issue with what you said, at NATO, he seems to have burrowed down to the granular uh, in, in these fees that the, the NATO allies are paying. He says the United States is, is, has this burden. We've been carrying it. We're not going to do it anymore. Here he is at NATO. Watch. I told people that I'd be very unhappy if they didn't up their commitments very substantially because the United States has been paying a tremendous amount, probably 90 percent of the cost of NATO. But yesterday, uh, I let them know that I was extremely unhappy with what was happening, and uh, they have substantially upped their commitment. Yeah. And now we're very happy and uh, have a very, very powerful, very, very strong NATO, much stronger than it was two days ago. Your reaction? Well, Trump is exactly right to say that there's a burden-sharing problem with NATO. Presidents going all the way back to Dwight Eisenhower have complained about that. It's been a long-standing problem. Mm -hmm. But I will note that he seems to not understand the actual mechanism of how this works. Mm -hmm. In his complaints about it, he talks about some, he seems to indicate that there's some fund out there that we all contribute to a NATO fund and, you know, uh, other members owe us back dues and all this kind of thing. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Countries pay for their own security, their own defense budgets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a commitment in the Obama administration for all NATO member countries by 2024 to reach 2 percent of GDP in right. their military spending. Um, and they haven't done that. That's totally true. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a couple of strange problems with this complaint about NATO burden, burden sharing and European uh, spending on defense. Um, the first thing is that Part of the idea behind NATO, the original purpose of it, was to incentivize European countries to underspend on defense. That was the mm -hmm. idea of it. So to complain about it, even though that's the strategy as it originated, is a little strange. The other problem is that this arbitrary emphasis on 2% of GDP doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, countries shouldn't arbitrarily pick a percentage of their GDP of what to spend on defense. They should look at their interests, they should look at the threats that they face, and make their decision about spending to accommodate that. You know, some people say they're underspending on defense, but I'm not quite sure that's true. Well, the really... truth is the United States is overspending in that's NATO. That's exactly that's right. The, that's and, the reality. And if Trump wants NATO countries to spend more, there's a simple way to do that. We spend less. Mm -hmm. But he did the opposite. He mm -hmm. campaigned on greater military budgets, and he passed mil uh, higher military budgets. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 
I'm not sure where. So the you would be for from. the United States spending less in NATO? Absolutely. I mean, we've spent in the past 30 years mm -hmm. about 15 trillion dollars on our military. That far exceeds what any other country has spent mm -hmm. by a long shot. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason is that we have to sp we have to spend enough to have a big enough military to fulfill all of the commitments that we have. And we're ex and overextended and all over the world. We're treaty bound to com yeah. you know defend about 60 or 70 nations. Yeah, Ike also wanted those troops back home, and he thought they would be home in what 12 years from the start of NATO, something right. like that. They're still there. Um, what do you make of his argument? And, and we'll play a little clip of that as I talk about it, that when he, he yelled across the table at the breakfast the other day to uh, the Allies saying Germany is yeah. basically ruled by Russia because of that Nord Stream uh, pipeline, now a second one uh, being contemplated, being built. Uh, does he have a point that Germany is undermining the alliance by doing a side energy deal with Russia who controls the spigots? Well, look, I think it's true that Germany in this context, there's a tension between its security and economic interests and its kind of normative and ideological commitments. Mm -hmm. So it wants to stand up to Russia, uh, especially about its actions in Ukraine and, and the Crimea. And they really have been at the forefront of criticizing Russia and standing up mm -hmm. to Putin. On the other hand, it's in their economic and security interest to get cheap uh, yeah, energy. Cheap, cheap uh, it's gas. It's going right from Russia's shores under the Baltic Sea mm -hmm. right to Germany's shores. And that's really cheap and easy for them. And so, you know, I don't, I, it's not really fair to, to badger them over this. Uh, it's not clear that they're under the control of Russia or captive by, of Russia. You know, I think that was a kind of overstatement. By well, Trump. they could be, though. I mean, down the, just as a strategic weapon that Putin could use, he has done this before to Ukraine by cutting off the energy, right? Sure. To weaken them. But look, if you look at the whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, the European spending on defense is about is is an order of magnitude what Russia spends. Russian military spending is roughly the same as uh, the, the Russian GDP mm -hmm. is roughly the same as Spain's. Mm -hmm. They're a pretty weak economy. They have all kinds of demographic problems, mm -hmm. problems with corruption, things that are dragging down the economy. Their ability to project power and represent a really grave threat to Europe is pretty limited. And limited. Uh, before I let you go, let's talk for a moment about this uh, quickie meeting with Theresa May, the drive-by with the Queen at Windsor Castle. What is the president going to accomplish here? Um, I know Theresa May's government is in some flux now. Two of her big cabinet officials resigned right. during the week over this Brexit deal that they've been working on for years. Right. Where does this lead Brexit and what can the president achieve here, if anything? So I think that's a lot of politics and not much policy. Mm -hmm. Britain's trying to figure out how to comply with their population's decision in the referendum, mm -hmm. and it's causing a lot of destabilization in Theresa May's uh, administration. Uh, you know, it's it, Trump likes the Brexit thing. He thinks it was part of his campaign. Mm -hmm. He feels some camaraderie with that kind of vote. Uh, and he's going to try to play it up for pol political reasons, but not much to be done on policy. On policy. John Gleiser, thank you so much for being here Thanks. at the Cato Institute. And you can follow John's commentary at Cato.org. Jenny Stepanek is up next right after these stories. The Vatican has dropped its criminal charges against its first auditor general, Libero Milone. Milone, who was arrested in June of last year, claimed he was a victim of falsified evidence in an attempt to block his investigations into Vatican finances, where he reportedly uncovered evidence of corruption. In an Italian interview on Saturday, Malone said Vatican officials told him that he was no longer subject to any criminal proceedings or convictions. A source told the National Catholic Register that the former partner at a very prestigious accounting firm who was hired in 2015 as part of Pope Francis's financial reforms was indeed becoming increasingly effective as the Auditor General and, quote, came too close to uncovering dangerous things. The source continued, in the end, action had to be taken to stop him. And the cause of canonization for Rhoda Wise, the Canton, Ohio mystic, who deeply influenced the spiritual life of Mother Angelica, is on its way to Rome for consideration. The Diocese of Youngstown officially closed its two-year investigation into her life this past weekend, thus completing the first steps toward canonization. Wise was known as a stigmatic and miracle worker. In 1943, a 19-year-old Rita Rizzo, the future Mother Angelica, was told by Mrs. Wise to pray a novena to St. Therese 
asking for the healing of a chronic and extremely painful stomach ailment. On the ninth day, Rita Rizzo was healed. The event convinced young Rita that God knew her and loved her, and in response, she devoted her life to God. Rhoda Wise spiritually influenced countless others. At the age of 60, she died from hypertension. 14,000 people attended her funeral mass in 1948, 70 years ago this week. Finally tonight, she's the mother of Matty Stepanek, the prolific poet, peace advocate, and philosopher who captured the hearts of media figures and the public alike. Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, Jimmy Carter, and countless others were touched by the purity of his message and the faith that informed it. Jenny Stepanek has carried on his message despite her own hardships and is herself a courageous example of living and loving beyond disability and loss. We spoke with her a little earlier about this year's Peace Day celebration in honor of her son. Here in an exclusive interview is Dr. Jenny Stepanek. Jenny, Maddie would have been 28 years old this July 17th. Uh, it's a big day, which we're going to talk about in a minute. What do you want people to know about he and his message all these years later? I would say that his message is as valid, as necessary, and as real today as it was when he was sharing it. Um, hope is real, and peace is possible, and life is worthy. And I think the more we learn in our world, the more we grow forward, the more um, things like social media connect us, the more important it becomes for us to understand the importance of peace and our personal choices in what we say in what we do um, and how we interact with people. Um, and, and I think that's really where we are now is, is bringing peace up to date and making it relevant to youth and adults today. Mm -hmm. I am always amazed um, just seeing you looking so great, so engaged, so vibrant. Uh, people wouldn't know that since we last saw you on the show, uh, you've been diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. You're battling neuromuscular disease. What of Maddie's message or words have inspired you to go on, to continue this celebration and battle? Um, when I was going through chemotherapy a couple of years ago, I actually would blog every week and I would find something that Maddie wrote and create an entire blog based on that uh, because Maddie inspired me to believe that hope is real. Hope is not a magical cure, it's not a fix, it's not a miracle that's going to heal you. But hope um, anchored in faith, anchored in finding some reason to be grateful um, or even a source of service for someone else, even in moments of suffering, that that, that can get you into some next moment, can help you deal with even the worst pain. Um, so Maddie inspired me to really root myself in hope, um, not an illusion, um, but in the hope that somebody beats the odds, in the hope that even with progressive diagnoses, that I have purpose and that that purpose can be to serve God and to serve others and to be a source of hope and peace for our world, just as Maddie was. One of the things I loved about Maddie's message, more importantly, Maddie's example and yours, is that despite the challenges you were dealing with or that he was dealing with, you're focused really on the other people and on others. And uh, tell the story of the day that the Oklahoma City bombing happened. He's what, four years old? He was four years old. It was in April of 1995. And he had been watching something on TV and it went off and the news came on and it was about the Oklahoma bombing. Um, I quickly turned it off and tried to explain to him what had happened. But in that brief amount of time, he had already seen these devastating images um, of children and adults who died um, and who were going to be survivors and living with the pain. And I talked to him about praying um, for the survivors, praying for the victims. Um, and he said, that's, that's important. We can pray for the families, we can pray for them, but we need to really pray for the people who did this because they're the ones that don't have peace in their hearts. 
We need to pray for people to have peace so that this stops. And he was as concerned about whoever caused this violence as he was about the children and the adults and the survivors in a different way. It was a different mm -hmm. type of concern, a different type of prayer. But in, in his heart, Jesus died for sinners and he wanted the sinners to have peace in their heart and to understand why this was wrong. Mm. Why no matter what you're going through, this is not the right choice to deal with whatever your reality is or whatever your anger or issue is. He also had a pretty dramatic response to 9-11. Yes. Um, Tell us what happened. Um, well, with 9-11, he watched personal friends literally go up in ash. He had been with firefighters on September 10th and those very firefighters, some of them were in the World Trade Centers on September 11th and died. Um, and on that day, um, Maddie wrote a series of poems um, and passages for peace where he initially struggled questioning, it, can we still find peace? Is there national security? Is there hope? It, it, are we ever going to really get along with each other and stop this unnecessary violence? By the end of the day, um, he wrote a poem um, called For Our World that essentially says we need to stop, be silent and notice, and to rebuild the mosaic of humanity, stop shattering it. Um, I would say one of his biggest responses to interrupted peace was actually in 2003 when um, the United States bombed Iraq. Mm -hmm. And Maddie was in the hospital at the time. And um, we were watching some evening TV program and they interrupted. And when he realized what he was seeing was missiles and bombs falling on Iraq and he had been working so hard to create passages to inspire people to understand why war is an unnecessary evil and that there are ways to resolve our conflicts without bombs. And when he saw these bombs fall, he literally had a physiological response. It changed his heart rate, his blood pressure, his skin turned blue. Um, he was spiritually and emotionally devastated and physically compromised. And doctors and nurses were worried about him. Um, I was quite worried. Um, he really struggled with that but came back even stronger um, and committed to sharing a message of peace and sharing it in more and more ways so that people understand how peace begins. Not about pausing violence, but about how to begin peace. How to teach kindness and empathy to children. How to teach um, thoughtfulness and, and instill and nurture resilience in children and adults. So he began really breaking down the message into specific elements of hope and peace so that people could better understand. You mentioned empathy, and he had it in amazing ways. I mean, even when he was struggling with imminent death, choking on his trachea, battling in and out of really, he crossed over to the other side and came back a few times. Tell me about that, the empathy you saw there in the hospital, in the hospital room. In the hospital room, I had seen empathy in Maddie from the time he was literally 13 months old at a church picnic where he showed empathy for a, a toddler who was crying and, and he comforted her and, and helped her. And I saw that exact same empathy throughout his entire life and the day he died. Um, we knew he was dying. We didn't know it would be that day, but we knew he was gasping for breath. His bones were broken and he was struggling literally for every single breath. And the baby in the next bed in the ICU was crying and crying. And Maddie started calling out nurse, 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 because uh, he could, couldn't even really speak well anymore. And the nurse came running in and, and said, what's wrong, are you in pain? And he said, the baby, the baby. And she said, what's wrong? Is the, the crying bothering you? And he said, no. Um, and he said, hold the baby. The baby is the future. The baby has purpose. Comfort the baby. Comfort the baby. And that nurse started crying. Um, and she picked up the baby and, and Maddie said, sing, 
And so she sang to the baby. Um, and, and Maddie died within 24 hours of, of this happening. But he was so concerned about this baby knowing you matter, even though you're in a hospital and you're suffering and you're in pain, but you matter, you have purpose, you are loved, you are cherished, and somebody's going to comfort you and hold you. Um, and that was within the day of his death. You have some concerns that people think of Maddie as a celebrity and that Oprah is responsible for him in well, many ways. I, I think when people hear Maddie's name, they think of him as Oprah's kid, and I think that's lovely. I think that's wonderful. And Maddie and Oprah were very close. They were sincerely friends and loved each other, and to this day she still loves him. And people think Maddie wanted to be on her show because he had poetry books. Mm -hmm. Really, his wish was that um, Maddie, Maddie said when he was six years old, okay, and he wasn't on her show until he was 11. Right. When Maddie was six years old, um, he came to me and he said, God put Oprah Winfrey and me on earth at the same time with purpose. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, did he now? Oh, <laughs> okay, really? Course, yeah. Um, because he'd read but, a little biography of her. He, he, he had read he, a little book about bought. her, and it was like an aha moment for him. Like, mm -hmm. this is the person that's going to sh amplify my purpose. He said, God gave me a purpose of shaping a message of hope and peace so that people can understand what God wants them to understand. He said, I shape it for children, for adults. I shape it for Christians, for non-Christians. He said, I shape hope and peace into something that people understand how they can be a source of hope and peace, even in hopeless moments, even in moments of suffering, even when there's war and trauma. Um, but he said, what I need is to get this message out to the world, because otherwise I've got this message. I've done what God's asked me to do. I have been a messenger. I've shaped it. But then it just sits in my computer. And he saw Oprah as the vehicle of that heart song, and, that And message. so he saw that people turned to Oprah for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that Oprah Winfrey was a person that knew what it was like to suffer, she was not born rich. She knew what it was like to suffer and rise up out of the ashes. So he believed that she would understand the message, and he wanted her to share the message that he had shaped. It was a bonus that he, she had him on the show, and it was an unusual situation that she realized he was real. He was not a poet kid. He was not a child whose mother wanted him to be on Oprah. He was really a messenger of hope and peace. And that's why they became friends. That's why he was on her show multiple times, not because he was a cute celebrity kid, yeah. but because he was an authentic bearer of a message of hope and peace. Jerry Lewis also had him on as his MDA spokesman for a number of years. He was often on the telethon. I want to show people a little clip of that. You let them know what life is about because of your presence and your courage. Life is a gift, true. It's hard and it's not always the easiest thing. But if it wasn't, you know what? The challenges in life are a part of our life and that's how we learn. And some of us are meant to have a disease. And some of us, like you, are meant to help fight it. All of us have a reason. And we have to choose to always live our lives to the fullest. No one is better or worse than anyone else. We are different and beautiful. And I think that is an important and powerful message. People look at children with disabilities and see them as less than perfect. They see children with developmental disabilities as children that need fixing, that need help. The help that all children need, with or without disabilities, medical, physical, spiritual, or cognitive, the help they need is to become their best self, to realize their purpose and their gifts from God and celebrate those gifts in a way that makes the world a better place, a fuller place. And so when you're, when you're born with a disability, yes, there's suffering involved, but it's not a mistake. It's, it's not that God made an oops and this child is less than another child. And Maddie understood that. And he cherished all children. 
all children, all people. Now I see you struggling against infirmity and time to continue this message, to spread it. What is that heart song that you want people to hear, both Maddie's and yours? I'll begin with mine. Mine is simply that you matter, and each moment matters. And we can't control whether a moment is going to be one with suffering or one worthy of celebration. All we can have a choice in is what we do with that moment and with the next moment, how we move through it. All we can do is choose to be kind, choose to reflect God's presence in any moment, choose to, of course we all hope for another moment. I have prayed to overcome the odds. I, I've prayed for more time. Um, I've been told several times for different reasons in the last three years that my time is up. Um, and yes, I'm human. I pray for more time. Um, I am looking forward to being with my children again. I, I do hope that I see the face of God. But life is so worthy, even amid suffering, that it, if I can find a way to be a source of hope for someone else, and I learned this from Maddie, all right? Maddie's heart song was to, to be a source of hope and peace for other people so that it becomes real. If they don't believe it's real, be real for them. And that was why Oprah loved him. He was real. And I've learned that as well, is that if I can be helpful to you, hope for you, if I can bring you a moment of peace, then I'm reflecting God's presence on earth even amid challenges. And that makes life worthy for me and for you. You matter. Every moment matters. Tell me about July 14th, a big celebration, an a important day. A big celebration, day. yes. Um, every year, the city that Maddie lived in, um, since he died, they've always proclaimed his birthday as a day of peace in his honor. Rockville, Maryland. Rockville, Maryland. Um, and every year, um, Rockville, Maryland and his King Farm neighborhood, they join Maddie's foundation. And what we do is we have a big celebration um, that brings people together, not just to celebrate peace, but to understand Maddie's message of peace from God. We have all different tents that, that break it down into little nuggets. Um, why did he believe hope was real? How do we make peaceful choices with our neighbors? Um, what does it mean when he says we're a mosaic of gifts? Um, rebuild the mosaics. We have all these hands-on crafts and activities and music and games. We make it fun to learn about peace and to get to know your neighbor because we were created by God to be in community. So this creates community and brings people together and get to know your neighbors. What's incredibly exciting and literally historic this year is that in addition to the city of Rockville, um, Montgomery County and the governor of Maryland are also proclaiming Maddie's birthday as Days of Peace. Um, no state in our union has ever said we're going to have a day dedicated literally to peace. And Governor Hogan is dedicating Maddie's birthday as a day of peace for all citizens in the state of Maryland. And that's on July 17th. That's on his birthday's July 17th and all three peace days, city, county and state are going to be recognized on July 17th. And we actually, it's part of a national campaign. We want a national day of peace but you celebrate on a weekend because it's easier for neighbors to get together um, and play well with others mm -hmm. on a weekend. So the event is uh, Saturday, July 14th, one o'clock um, in King Farm, Maryland. Our MC is Jimmy Alexander from Mix 107.3. Uh, if you go to Maddie's website, maddieonline.com, uh, you can get the exact address and, um, and just come and learn about peace and celebrate with your neighbors and have a good time. I'm delighted you came. Thank you for sharing you. your heart song and Maddie's. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. I love you too, Raymond. Thank you. For more on Maddie Stepanek and his amazing life, his foundation, and the 2018 Peace Day celebration on Saturday, July 14th in Rockville, Maryland, visit maddieonline.com. For information on his cause, you can go to maddiescause.com. That's all the time we have for now, but until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week 
Ambassador for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, will be here, as will Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise, and much more. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.